until, that is, I reached the bread aisle, where I passed a woman holding her phone outstretched like a stunned creature she'd found in a hole that she was hoping a stranger might identify, saying toward it, I tried to find the hard bread you liked, but all they had was soft, so soft is what I got. And so then I was in a stage play as written by these two Terry Tut souls, which I rehearsed as I made my way through the aisles. Baked beans, baked beans. I tried to find the hard bread you like, but all they had was soft. So soft is what I got. Baked beans. When finally I caught a glimpse of myself reflected in the silver counters, wandering and muttering other people's grocery talk aloud, I realized there was no one home inside me. I had become a human cloud, shapeless and blurry in the chrome of the butcher's meat case. Yet this made sense to me, was as familiar as the arrival of winter. For just that morning I had not only finished a story that had kept me on its shipwrecked island for many months, but a number of other worrisome projects had also come to their ends. I had chopped and piled my wood for the coming snows, patched every hole in the cabin through which the rain had been dropping, and fixed my falling down shed simply because it was the most magnificently ancient wood structure I'd ever seen, and was in fact the reason I'd moved to my mountainside cabin in the first place. I'd always longed to turn the painterly shed into my writing room, but it had come to that part of its life when all it did was relentlessly fall to pieces. And yet, regardless, I continued to be drawn to images of scribbling out my stories in the honey spill of window light that crept through its ancient wafered glass. And so for many months I had become the impresario of these obligations, and now my pursuits had reached an end. Where once a train charging down the track under a boasting of coal smoke, I was now but the empty silver rails. And so, of course, at the very moment my collapsing shed was finally ready for a morning of scribbling in golden shadows, I had nothing at all in my head to scribble. In other words, my well had run dry. I'm not sure how I made it home from the Terry Tut but I must have followed some someone from the store and into town, and likely continued in my copycat way until I fell into the rut of the familiar pine needle path for home, where, you will not be surprised to learn, I had a supper of baked beans and soft bread. There was no other possibility. There is nothing wrong with this. We come and go in such ways, are full and then empty, busy and then becalmed, on the sea and then on the shore, move from inside to out, from someone to no one, from dream to sunshine, and charging train to silver rail. This is how it has always been for me, anyway, and I was back now, before the beginning of something else. And, though void of inner purpose, I could drink freely of the world and allow my well to replenish. A race of thoughts was on. Could I fill back up before my shed fell down? For a time, then, fine, yes, I would embrace all this. I would look at things like cracker boxes and say things like baked beans, for like a child. Imitation of others had always been a means of self-discovery for me. Eventually something would catch, and I would begin to fill again, and before I knew it, I'd be hurtling along my private silver rails, once more the charging train 
scribbling away in the glimmer glows of my fragile old masterpiece of a shed. The following day, my eye was caught by a number of blackbirds at my feeder, and I whistled out to them their own calls to see what it felt like to be a bird. Baked beans, baked beans, I might have been saying in bird song. And before I knew it, I was chasing after them through forest and field until all but one had outmaneuvered me. But there was this one old blackbird, as tossed from purpose and as bereft of meaning as I, who undertook small, uncertain hopping flights from tree to tree, where it rested, lost with seeming sad wings, and sang with a whistled breast of wonder, and who I followed all morning, until I found myself on the edge of town, where my attention shifted to a man pushing his car along the road. He was a middle-aged fellow with rusty hair and powerful parts, huge, strong wrists, and a quarryman's knees. Very imaginable bones, I suppose I might soon enough describe him in my delicate shed if it didn't blow down. The car was missing its driver's side door, and this rusty stone fellow, Gerald Cutler, I soon recognized him, was shouldering its bulk along the roadway with one hand on the wheel. Another car came alongside him, and someone called from a window, What happens if you get to a hill, Gerald? Gerald Cutler opened his mouth to respond, and in my no-one-home condition I did as well and I saw him realizing, and I realized it with him, that he, and now I, had not foreseen the problem of such hills, and as well we both knew, hills were coming. I followed him as he struggled on, wanting to turn the page in this saga of a rusty-haired man with such imaginable bones, pushing a car without a door along a flat road, toward inevitable hills. And, of course, I was calling out quietly in the wandering, breathy whistle of my lost bird friend. What happens if you get to a hill, Gerald? When certain brief sections of the mostly flat road dropped mildly and the car took to its own speed, Gerald began to jog alongside it like a boy with a runaway shopping cart. To keep with him, I had to run myself, which, yes, I am still briefly capable of managing. And when the car hit the next small climb and slowed and halted, Gerald and I both stopped too and mopped our brows and rested a moment before pushing on. Real troublesome hills lay ahead, both up and down, and an even greater rise into the notch that we both knew Gerald would never manage on his own, despite his builder's wrists and quarryman's knees. It was not a simple witness I was bearing here, but something else had begun to struggle to faint life inside me. I was out and without purpose, and Gerald was in and full of it, and his in had begun to tug at me, which is another thing I should like to say. We can make use of the passions of others and borrow their energy into our own empty tanks. Such is one of the magics of our incorporated and shared creaturehood. For we aren't much different than birds flying in flocks after and upon each other in ways more similar to the wind than such fragmented hearts would suggest. We continued on along the flattish road, running on the minor downs, resting before the little ups, and on through town and past the service station, where I thought he might be heading to fill the tank with gas or have his vehicle jump-started, and not only was I running and resting with him, 
but I had begun to perform his arduous role, and soon myself was shouldering against the notion of a hulking shape beside me, and went pushing at the ghost of a car, with my own arm stretching out to guide a steering wheel of air. As we pushed our cars along, and ran now and then, and rested as we needed, there came the foretaste of a rousing adventure, where I saw myself joining with Gerald Cutler in a great car-pushing journey across the land. And thus I had two things now, initial language and initial image. I had those simple three words, very imaginable bones to which now attached the mildest image of a story of pushing a car with Gerald Cutler across the land, which I could, I thought, even that moment, begin to sketch at in the drizzling candlelight of my hopefully still standing shed. When the first real great hill rose forbiddingly before him, and he leaned into an utmost heaving against the car, which yet so spitefully slowed, I watched with some satisfaction, as Gerald perceived the unexpected lightening of his burden, and turning to discover the cause, saw me there at the back of his car, our car it had become sweat on my brow and pushing at the rear with all the push I had to push. He nodded his thanks, and I nodded mine, small heroes of the hill climb, alone and unseen and known only to each other. So we pushed and groaned and forced our way to the cruel summit and upon feeling the forgiveness and almost love of the levelling grade as the car began to pull free of our hands and the hill began to fall on its far side down, Gerald nodded again, and I did too, and we both ran for the rolling car and jumped in, me behind the wheel, that he might rest in the passenger seat, I steered us together down the airy way like tobogganing brothers descending a sledding slope, until finally we slowed in a mumbling drawl on the resuming flatness of the road, as that beautiful and sleepy ticker tap and frost and pop and boil of gravel under wheels commenced like a kind of faraway cooking until all movement and sound ceased together in a well-earned kingdom of silent seas. It was evening then, and Gerald lay unconscious in the back seat of the car, and I pushed us off alone into a small meadow canyon and made a meager fire and prepared us supper. He woke to the smoke of food on the fire and came to sit on a stone I'd set out for him, Baked beans, I said. I tried to find the hard bread you'd like, but all they had was soft, so soft is what I got. And we ate and saw the stars and slept by the fire in the cold canyon, and the following day continued our journey, pushing the car across the land. Easily we coursed along the morning flat, running and resting here and there as the mild bluffs rose and fell, and nodding our agreement we went grueling up the long hardships of the afternoon hills, and with childlike joy went sledding down the evening mountains until we ate once again on stones beneath the stars and slept by fires in the cold canyons, and this went on week after week. A day arrived when I had no memory of whose car it was, or whose idea it was to push it anywhere, or why, but only that my body had discovered its needed hardship, and my soul the blood of vital purpose. There was a stone and skylark meaning in pushing the car together somewhere, with the comforting fellowship of a shared task, and floating high above us as well, the unacknowledged warm cloud 
of the greater mystery at hand. Not only had I no idea of our destination, nor understanding of the point of our mission, but for the life of me, these were the only two things on earth I cared not to know in the least. The light that drips along through the crooked glass almost seems to leak and creak upon my page, as though to slow and grab at my pen as I try to get it all down, even as the shed itself is never not in the tremble of its own dust. And yet, and yet, and yet, what I write is not much my own, though the lettering and images on the package may be, but I am more the box around which the world I've seen is held, the whistle breath of a lost blackbird, a man with a watch on both wrists, a woman with her phone like a found creature, Gerald Cutler and his car. All these are found within me now, and within my shed on my mountain, and on these pages, as I go charging down once more along my silver rails. Push and not glide and hold, stone and fire, beans and bread, stars and sleep, in and out and sun to dreams and train to rail. Run, rest, run, rest, run. Atoms, motion, and the void.